I'm going to call to order a special meeting of the Board of Trustees of North Idaho College for the purpose of presidential interview. Would you all, we have a quorum, I see, so would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dr. Wolf, Chair Wolf, before we bring in the candidate, I've got something for all the other trustees, if I may give it to all of you real quick. Um, these are some questions that we got late today, and I was running late today, so I happened to check the email rather late. So here's a few pages of questions that came in from citizens. Um, they've asked we would consider asking of the candidate today. I'll share those with you. Thank you. Then I would like to welcome you, Dr. Swain. I wasn't done yet, sir. Excuse me. I wasn't done yet. I passed it on. I did something to say about the question, if I may. Or if not, but uh, I see we have a new agenda today. We've changed it for the third time. These are questions since we had such a challenge asking questions previously, and you've talked about how you're what the people have asked us to do. But here's the concern, and I'm just going to say it before we start this process, sir. We're still very inconsistent with this, and now we have a third candidate. Who's going to have a different process than the prior two? I mean, if I was Dr. Brand, I'd ask for my money back. He got questions from Greg that no one else will hear about. Topics such as CRT. Some folks, he got to go to, he went to dinner. I don't know if that was good or bad. Different times of the tours. Yeah, I wasn't even aware of this, but some folks are seeing Parker before some aspects of their interviews and some are seeing it after. For me, I'd want to see Parker first. I'd be much more knowledgeable as I started to ask, answer questions along the CTE. Uh, subject. And so I'm just going to say it right now. We've been inconsistent. We continue to be inconsistent. I think I think it's, it's broke. And I think you guys own it because you broke it, so it's yours. And uh, I think uh, I'm disappointed that each of the uh, candidates was not able to have the same experience uniformly across all five, whether that be the interviews, the timing, or the Towards the uh, the informal dinner, so we could get to know them a little better, and spend time with them and, and their spouse if they were accompanied. And uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to watch, even how a couple of you never asked a single question on Thursday, but suddenly yesterday you guys did. And it was observed to me that one of them was kind of a follow-up to one of the questions during one of the forums about tenure, to maybe give a redo on to answer that question. They have a softball question there, so. I just think we've changed this on the fly, and uh, quite frankly, uh, I'm not in a position where I want to validate or, or legitimize the process any further. And we've been excluded. We can't answer all our questions. We got cut off the other day, and you already had arranged it so that we couldn't have full participation in the process. So no offense, sir, but there's at least two of you I can't even have the chance to interview. So to interview two of you. Is unfair to the two I couldn't interview, or maybe if you had a poor interview, maybe it'd be to your advantage. So this is yours, guys, and you own it. So you can claim it and keep it. So. My apologies for trusty badly. We are going to go right ahead with the interview process. The Chair process is. Yes. Okay. Uh, absolutely no respect, disrespect to you or anything, but I will be leading uh, part way through this interview. Um, before this process even began, before the final candidate, uh, there was zero attempt to factor in us elected trustees. These three got appointed and um, have exercised their majority on the board. Uh, with zero consideration of the other board members that we've had in the environment for some to. Um, so I just want to say I, I have a job during the day, and at the end of you, um, at the 
we had attempted to schedule around, though we tried, we could have early, easily done this in the early July, and it would have been a much smoother process. And um, so I have provided the candidate uh, my questions. I assume that they will be factored in at the end of the day, just like as if I was here. I would expect me to be respected, even in my absence. And um, I would appreciate that the questions and maybe Todd Banducci's questions that he's raised on behalf of the people who actually elected him um, be answered for the question. So I'm not, uh, I'll try and find a convenient time. I'll watch my own time and uh, just know it's not out of protest or anything to you, but I have a, a day job and multiple responsibilities. So, um, and I, I would say that I do think this process is unfair to the candidates and is unfair to the people you represent. So I definitely appreciate uh, Trustee Banducci's uh, words. Um, they ring true. You guys own this process. Okay, great. Thank you. We will go ahead with the interview. There are going to be 10 questions, and we will rotate asking these questions each of the, the uh, trustees. I'll start the first one off. Understanding the mission and vision of North Idaho College, walk us through what you believe are the most important elements of being a visionary president at NIC. Describe how your leadership style and approach will support a climate of engagement, accountability, and healing. So, um, as a visionary president, I think as a, as a president of North Idaho College, we have to figure out uh, why the population continues to grow and the enrollments are going down. So, um, from a practical, I don't, I don't know if that's visionary, but certainly from a practical perspective, we have to, we have to sort that out. If there's, um, if, if, if population was falling and, and enrollments were falling, it makes sense. But if, since there's a, one's going up and one's going down, we've got to figure out what the mismatch is with, um, with enrollments. So I think that's, that's the first thing. From a visionary perspective, I think North Idaho College has a very interesting opportunity to be a destination for students on their academic journeys, whatever, whatever that may be, whether it's to get a certification to go into industry, whether it's to get a, um, a career in technical education and go off into industry or to get an associate's degree and transfer or, or, or go off into, into their lives or, or transfer, um, can and should be seen as a valued destination along that path. Um, and I would hope that we would create an institution that students would not only want to start their journey on that, but come back frequently as they upskill or change directions of their career pathways. So creating that, um, being known in the community uh, as that kind of institution, I think is really the role of community colleges, but certainly of North Idaho College, because it is this kind of gem of the North where um, there's, there's not a lot of competition around here. We have to really stand out. And so figuring out what that is and what the right answer is with that is, um, is part of the process. Yeah. Second question, go ahead. I have a link at my board pack. Pardon? Go ahead. You'd rather I set the question? Sure. I'd be happy to. Second question, how would you reestablish a positive public image with our community and business partners to continue and evolve our efforts to best prepare and sustain the region's workforce? So I, I had a wonderful lunch today with the President's Cabinet, um, and, and I think they are dedicated, honorable people that have the best interest of the community, the students, and the college um, in mind. Um, I, I think that when there is discord in, the, in, in what's being promoted um, by, by the leadership, then we have a struggle to, with, with the, 
the population doesn't understand what's going on. And so when there's discord, um, all they know is that there are issues. And I talked to um, a student today, Alex, and um, he said that many of the counselors, high school counselors in the area are directing their students to other options and not to NIC because of the challenges that they see in what's going on. Now they don't understand the challenges, they don't understand what's going on. All they understand is that there's something going on and it's better to go <coughs> So we got to fix that. We got to. We have to speak with one voice. We have to um, talk to the community in a positive way and let them know the good things that are going on. And because I think there are a lot of good things that are going on at North Idaho College. And so being able to, to explain that and um, and let them know that that we are on the right path um, and we're fixing anything that is not on the right path. Um, we'll, we'll get that unity back. Um, I think that based on what I've heard and talked to the community, I, I think that um, there is strong support for North Idaho College. So it's just a matter of getting, getting our momentum back. Pete, you have question number three. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, what type of programming and curriculum innovations have you implemented to increase student retention? completion, graduation, and persistent rates? Um, I've done a couple of things. Um, I, I uh, started my higher ed career running the ROTC program at James Madison University. And um, when I got there, uh, the university's ROTC program was ranked 231 out of 234. So it could have gone lower, but not much. Um, and the way to fix that was recruiting and retention. And how do you fix recruiting and retention? For me, it was um, talking to the students, figuring out why they're, you know, why are they struggling? What are their problems? And having a, a real conversation with them and making sure that they knew they could come and talk. I mean, I was a department head, so I was a senior person. Um, and, and yet I wanted them to be, feel very comfortable coming and talking to me and letting them know, letting me know when they were having trouble with the class um, so that I could reach out. Now, as a university president, they're probably not gonna have 4,000 students coming and talking to me, but the guidance counselors, the people in that role where they should be you know, talking to those students, they really have to be engaged. They have to um, listen to the students when the students are having problems, figure that out. So, so I think that's, um, that's that was really important for me and it turned the program turned our program around turned our department around in two years we were number one in the country and so i would say that was um, a, a real turnaround um in terms of other innovative stuff um i i run this program called jmux lab that i started in 2015 and um it was a program really to bring students from across the campus, I work at a four year institution, so students have majors in, um, and uh, it, you know, they don't have CTE, they, there's not adult education, it's, it's really focused on the four year um, program. But um, what happened was the students became so engaged, we, were, we focused on problem solving, not on a discipline. So you don't, you don't, you don't take an XLAB class in, in um, thermodynamics or in, um, in, you know, basic biology, it's in a problem solving things like um, human trafficking or um, any, any number of, we do hacking for defense, about 20 different courses. But the, the focus is on a problem. And so bringing students and faculty from across campus together to work on those kinds of problems, what happened was, and we didn't really expect it, but what happened was the, um, the students became so excited about working with real problems with real people in the community um, and working across disciplines understanding how their computer science degree is going to um, contribute to solving this problem or how their nursing degree is going to contribute to solving the problem um, and working on those multidisciplinary teams the students became incredibly uh, engaged to the point where uh, i had to send them home at night i mean they would they would stay up at night um, and so it's, it's tough to say that that 
I know I don't know if that program would work here or not, um, but programs that engage students, that get them excited about learning, that students get to work with the, the public and really become a community within this community college and get out there and work with students so that while they're taking classes, they're actually engaging with the members of the community. Um, I, I think that that will have a, a major impact on their ability to stay engaged, stay interested, and also build a network because that's, that's really where a lot of the, um, the strength comes is in your network. How, when, even if they go to, onto a four-year institution, they, I want them to be able to reach back to this network that they've created while they, were, while they were here and working so that people like you can say, hey, I, I know somebody who can help you move forward. And so getting the students out and mixing it in with the community, I think is re really the purpose of a community college. And, um, can really strengthen the, the student experience. Are you aware of the partnership with Gizmo Coeur d'Alene? speak. Are you aware of the partnership with Gizmo Coeur d'Alene on campus here? Yeah, yeah. We, well, we drove past it today. It was not open, but yeah, I drove past it, and um, I, I'm aware it's 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 a it's a makerspace facility on campus. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest would be more after. Okay. Sure. Sometime today, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Sure. Question four, what would be your short-term strategy to increase enrollment in the current competitive landscape? Wow. Um, I, I, I keep going back to this, is that um, typically what, what we do in higher ed is we sit around a room like this and we think about what the problem is and we talk about it and we come up with solutions and then we start to move forward. And yet the, the people that are not showing up is not us. It's folks like Alex. Um, and I, I, point, I, I, sorry to call you out, but I had a great conversation with Alex and, and uh, he's one of the senators in, the, in ASNIC. Um, and, and so I, I would actually spend time talking with students, um, potential students and current students about why they're not coming if they're potential students and why they're here and how they're, why their friends are not here. Um, I think there's incredible power in that. I think we learn a lot about that. Um, and you know, if, to me, the one short term answer is as, as president, I would go talk, I would go talk to those counselors that are telling students to go to other options because they don't understand the real problems that are taking place here and they're acting on um, kind, kind of rumors and say, you know, come to come to NIC, and I will make sure that your students are well cared for, and that their credits will count, their credits will transfer. And that's one of the concerns that these guidance counselors have. And so, as a, as a president of the institution, I think that is probably the most impactful thing that you can do. You get guidance counselors on your side. Get the guidance counselors to you know look them in the eyes, shake their hands, and say, come to North Idaho College, and we will take care of those students. We will make sure that the parents aren't mad at you. Two years from now, when um, you know they're, they're, they'll be happy that you sent your uh, recommended their students come to NIC. Yeah. 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 Doctor, give us an example of innovative strategies that you've developed to retain and attract high performing talent. So, um, what what I do to attract talent is. Um, what I've done in the past is um, just like attracting students is you have really compelling programs. So you build compelling programs that people want to participate in. They see the mission, they understand the commitment, they understand where you're going. Um, they want to be on the team. So that's, that's probably the overarching aspect of, of things. People want to be on the team. They will come and, and join the team and pay is not that then is, is not why they are making those decisions. They're making decisions because they see what's going on, they see the impact in the community, and they want to be on the team. Um, and so we got to we ultimately kind of that's the long term goal. Um, the short term goal is uh, you know you look at your best performing people and you ask them for recommendations. Um, I I have um, often asked my colleagues for recommendations of students. 
hire students right out of college. Um, tell me who your best student is and I want to hire them. Um, so I hire those folks. Um, so it's, it's really relationship based, I suppose, is in, in the end. Um, building relationships where people are going to refer the best, the top talent to you. Um, and, um, and, and then the fact that we might not be competitive on pay is not as much of an issue, particularly if they're from the area. But, um, you know, if people, people believe in the mission, they believe where you're going, um, and they've been referred by a friend, I, I think that's pretty effective. How would you describe the financial condition of NIC? Where would you focus your attention? Provide the best examples that reflect your ability to manage NIC finances today and post pandemic. Well, I, I spoke with the um, director of finance today um, and her assessment is that NIC is in, in actually very sound financial condition. Um, I'm, I'm certain, like any public institution, you could always use a couple of million more. Um, but she's she was pretty positive um, and said that there was not only are are we um, eliminating most of the um, deferred maintenance, which is a killer for a, a university. Deferred maintenance almost never gets fixed, but they're going to eliminate most of the uh, deferred maintenance backlog. Um, and she said they have um, a, a, a good amount of money set aside for professional development, which I think is really critical for community colleges to get our faculty out and get them uh, prepared. So I think financially, at least in the short term, and I see in good shape. Um, long term, we got to fix the, re the recruiting and retention issue. Um, and, and I think those two things together will um, secure the, the, the future um, stability of the institution. Let me read your question. Yeah. Be happy to. Describe your fundraising experience. What will be your approach to building successful donor relationships in our region? My uh, so at at my institution, um, twenty two thousand students. They have a big development office. Um, they determine. Who gets to talk to donors? So I don't, I, I'm, I don't get to talk to donors much until a donor says I want to give to 4VA, Jamie X, so one of the programs that I manage, and then all of a sudden I'm important. Um, and so um, I would also say that that although the size of the institution is much larger, I think that the foundation and development office here probably not much. Um, I, I think I think we're probably on fairly even terms, and I think we raise more money. But in terms of experience, with with uh, between where I'm at and here, pretty even terms. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, AT and T, big company, reached out and said we'd like to give money to X Lab. My foundation guy comes over. We do a conference call, and um, they they explain what they want to do, and we said okay. $10,000. Okay, great. Um, the guy said, the, the AT&T rep says, I was thinking 20. Um, he called back the next day and said, let's make it 25. So why did he do that? Well, I, I, again, I think having really compelling programs where you're demonstrating impact, where you have um, an impact in the community, the student learning, um, you're telling the positive story of what's happening on campus. People want to give, and and when that happens, you don't you don't have to go you know around with your hat in hand asking people to donate. People want to give. They want to be part of success. And so um, I I think from my that, what's my strategy? I think that's my strategy. We create really good compelling programs. We tell the story, um, talk about the successes of the institution. Um, show and, and and really market the student success and the impact we have on students and the community. And, and I think donors will make money available. Number eight, Pete. 
What successes have you had in lobbying with regional, state, and national politicians? How will you employ these strategies at North Idaho College? Um, again, in my institution, we're sort of limited on our ability to do that. I will say that of uh, recently, um, we were asked uh, to present a, an appropriations proposal um, to our senators and congressmen. Now, interesting state, we have two Democratic senators and our local um, uh, representative is a Republican. And so we presented a, a program that would look at what we do in XLAB and how we could do that model in many communities around the state that um, I, I call flyover communities, where in, you know in, in Idaho it's probably uh, Boise, Pocatello, and Moscow get all the attention from the state because they're the big schools. They're the, there's something going on. Give it to give it to them, and they'll they'll filter out. And and so my proposal was to um, help up, help us do that for all these schools that are kind of ignored and forgotten. Um, and um, I, I told the university president, I think this is going to resonate with both parties and with both houses. And so um, what has happened then is we've, we've met with both senators and our representative, and they both want to support the appropriation. Um, one of our biggest supporters in the state is a um, is a uh, Republican senator, a Republican congressman from uh, the other side of the state, but just believes that what we're doing with XLAB is the future of higher ed. So again, I go back to the same, if, you, if you're doing good things, if you're demonstrating impact, and, and, and all of our programs are not expensive. I mean, we, we do it on a, on a pretty limited budget. And so if you're doing all that um, and you're creating impact, and you're telling the story, and you're letting folks know about what you're doing, um, then they support you. And I, I don't think that's any different from donors than it is from legislators. Legislators need to have a good story. They want to have good things happening in their districts. And so we want to tell them about the good things that are happening in their district so they can brag about it with their, you know, with their buddies down in Boise when they're in, in um, session. So I, I don't think that there's a big difference between donors and legislators in, the, in those terms. People want to see value, they want to get what, you know, get something for their money, um, and they want to see impact on student learning in the community. This is Ari Todd's question number nine. Tell us your vision for managing change and innovation. What would be your strategy for ensuring that NIC remain the leader and first choice for education in the region? That's a tough question, um, because I think I think the biggest thing that we have to do is um, reduce the amount of negative discord um, about NIC. Um, guidance counselors, people in the community, they don't know, they, they don't pay attention to what's going on. I'm on a school board myself, right? So I'm, I, I understand how this works. Um, and my, when people hear negative stories, they don't take the time to dig into it to understand what's going on. They just see something's going on and it is, I don't like what I'm hearing, so I'm not gonna send my student, I'm not gonna donate, I'm not gonna, so we've gotta really figure out how do we get the board and the leadership of the institution going in the same direction, having, having that shared vision and moving forward. So the, the change management, I think, is really, it's tough. It's, it's going to be tough. Um, and, you know, if, if I'm the president, I'm going to need your support and, and, uh, and assistance in that. Because we've, we've got to really get the board and the leadership of the institution sharing a vision for, for the future and, and moving things forward. Um, and we've got to, we've got, we've got to get out of the news, to be honest, um, at least for negative stuff got to start promoting good things that are happening. And I, I talked to Alex today. Um, you know, he's the only student I got to see today. So I'm going to keep pointing at Alex. But there are, uh, uh, actually, that's not true. I saw Hannah, who's on the search committee, young lady on the search committee. And they have amazing stories. The things that they're doing, he's a high school student. 
and, um, and is in the dual enrollment program and is doing phenomenal things is going to go on to the University of Idaho. Um, and, you know, five years, you're going to read about Alex. Um, those are things that people should be reading about in the paper and not the, the discord of um, things that are happening now. I mean, that's, that's really what has to happen. John, do you want any questions? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Doctor, based on your research at North Idaho College, please tell us your impressions of the college, including your most positive impressions and those you would like to address within the first 90 days. Well, I think I just addressed the 90 day thing. Um, and I think, honestly, there, there's two things. In, in the first 30 days, maybe maybe it'll take 90 days, but um, getting the board and the, uh, the the board and and the senior leadership focused and and moving in the same direction, getting positive messages out, and then talking to um, I, I, I'm serious. I will go talk to all of the guidance counselors um, in the area because they have got to stop telling people to go elsewhere. <coughs> North Idaho College is a phenomenal place, and um, and they have got to start um, letting us prove that. Um, so, what is the impressions of North Idaho College? Um, uh, the last time I was here, remember I, I grew up in Moscow. Um, uh, the last time I was here was probably 1982. Um, my uh, my friend went to uh, went to North Idaho College and then got an electrical engineering degree at U of I. Um, it looks a lot different than it did in 1982. Um, Coeur d'Alene looks a lot different than 1982. Um, and I was actually very favorably impressed with the buildings, the condition of the buildings, the condition of the campus. Um, how there is construction going on that had to have started before the recent surplus in the state budget. So, so people are doing the right things and they are moving forward. They're growing the facilities and growing the programs that meet the needs of the community. Um, so I was very favorably impressed by that. Um, all, I, I talked to, I think his name, Philippe, the, um, he's an illustrator, a professor who teaches illustration. Um, the, the, he was so excited about what he was doing and how um, the progress of his students and how they were all getting jobs that um, he said his biggest concern was that students are quitting school after a year because they're getting jobs and not sticking around to finish their degree. Um, one young lady he talked about was, got a job at Marvel Comics, illustrating for Marvel Comics. Well, that's pretty good. And he said, then she called, he, she said he's, she sent him a message that said, I'm quitting school. And he's like, no, no, please don't. And, and why? Well, I'm going to work for Marvel Comics. He said, okay. Um, and then two years later, she says, I'm quitting Marvel Comics. And he, no, don't quit Marvel Comics. That's great. She said, well, I got a job illustrating for, Net, for uh, Netflix. He said, okay. So um, to have students like that and have faculty that are so excited about what their students are doing and have students who reach out to the faculty to keep them informed about their successes, I think is, that to me is super impressive. Um, two or three years down the road, this young lady has no, um, you, you would imagine she has no relationship with this you know, professor anymore. But she was so impressed by the work that he did and how much he cared and how compassionate he was and how um, how much he cared about her success that three years later she still reached out. Um, I, I think that's that tells a great story about North Idaho College. Um, so the, I think those are the two things that I would uh, uh, pros and cons. Yeah. We're to the point now where individual trustees can ask you questions. And I'm going to start that off. I too spent 10 years on a school board. What is your experience with conflict resolution within a board? Can you tell us a little bit about your experience in that area? So um, I, I think, um, so I, I, I was first elected in 2009. 
Um, and every, the, and there, there seems to be every, every, we have six member board and every, um, every, every group, um, because it changes every two years, off-site elections. Um, there, there's always someone that um, has a single issue, uh, has a uh, contrarian opinion of what's what should happen, and and it's it's not easy. I mean, it would be much easier for everybody to just you know join hands and say kumbaya, but that's just not effective life. And so you have to really figure out, um, find common ground find out what what their issue is um and, and sometimes what you find out is that the reason why they ran and when they get on the board they find out that the reason that they ran is not really uh, they they didn't understand from the outside looking in what was going on well, now they get on the inside it's not it's not what they thought it was and so um, so then they, they, they struggle to find identity because they, they identified this issue to get elected. Um, that's the experience I've had. And so it's, it's helping them find an, a, another way forward. Like there's a, there's, there's gotta be something out there that you can put your, sink your teeth into that is positive and helping you, um, move the whole group forward. And, and, um, I'll say it's not always easy. Um, but, uh, you know, that's that's always what I try to do. Um, and currently, I'm, I serve as the chair, so I I, I uh, have you know I have a really big gavel, um, and uh, um, sometimes I've I've had to you know pe people want to say things in public that are not proper for public forum, and I have to gavel them out and say you know you're not speaking um, that is not appropriate for open session. Um, so I try not to do that because it doesn't um, it doesn't win friends and influence anyone, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. So talking to those folks, you know, you know the controversial issues that are going to come up ahead of time. You try to talk to them and let them know. Try to get them on board and do the best you can in those roles. But it's not always easy. I think you. Pete, you want to? Yes, for for the donors who don't want to come to you. Uh, how would you reach out to them? Talk us through some of your ideas. The donors that the donors that don't want to come that aren't automatically contributing. Um, so the the silent majority out there that you said. Yeah. So um, I, I I talked to the, uh, the the woman in charge of the foundation. She seems to have a pretty good handle on who who could give, who should give, and who is giving. Um, and so, um, one of the things that, and I think she has a really good handle on that. I, I think working with her is really the way forward in figuring out um, what motivates the donors, what would they be motivated in, why aren't they giving, and then um, trying to close that gap. So, so I think philosophically that's the way you do it. Donors tend to give. My my experience, donors tend to give because they have a relationship and because they're passionate about what it is they're doing and why. And so if you don't have a relationship with them and, and, um, and the first thing you do is call them up and say, Hey, we need a million dollars. Can you give us a million dollars? You're gonna, yeah. Okay. That's old school, right? You can, it's actually this now, right? You're going to get the push buttons, you know, hang up. But, um, and so you have to be patient. You have to build those relationships. Um, I think um, one of the things that we do is we host events. We bring people in. And I'm not going to ask for any. I, I, I try not to ask for money. I try to say, here's what we're doing. It's a compelling story. Here's where we could use help. Give me a call if you if you're motivated. Um, I, I I think some of the folks that are my big supporters will follow me here if I come. Um, because of the relationship. They don't have a relationship with North Idaho, they have a relationship with me. They don't have a relationship with JMU, they have a relationship with me. And so if, if they think that what I'm gonna do here is reflective of their goals and objectives, then um, I, I think they'll come. So um, I, I, 
don't know. Uh, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. John, do you have a question? Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Doctor, <clears throat> I think that there are four distinct communities at North Idaho College. There's students, faculty, staff, and then there's a board. And you need to be able to deal with each one of those communities in a different manner. Can you, can you expound on that? Well, I, I, I think there's probably more communities than that because you have CTE, um, the transfer program. So you have all these different programs that are distinct within North Idaho College as well. Um, and so, yes, uh, um, and, and I think the, the number one thing is communications. You have to be able to communicate with folks and, um, and, and get them, find, find common ground, find what inspires them. Um, and that's going to be different for each of those groups somewhat. I, I think when you talk to students, students want to have, uh, they want to learn, they want to be excited about learning. And I think for the most part, faculty want to be excited about teaching. So I don't see a huge difference between faculty and students um, in terms of what motivates them. They want to be um, heard and, and they want to have uh, opportunities. And I don't think that is a huge difference between students and faculty. Um, staff, I think, want to be supported and they want to know that their work is valued um, and that you listen to them. Um, the board is a different animal, um, and, uh, and and I, I think that's probably where the most work is going to have to take place. Is we've got to got to figure out how do we get all five members of the board pointing in the same direction. And uh, you know, as president, I can do some of that. As board members, y'all are going to have to step up as well. I mean, that's we've got to we've got to figure out how to make that move forward. And and you know, we we're going to function as a team. I'm a non-voting, if I'm the president, I'm a non-voting member of the board, but we got to work together as a team. we got to communicate. And, um, and when there are differences, um, differences, there's a lot that can be done outside the board meetings, one-on-one -on -one conversations where like, you know, explaining, talking, communicating, um, so that when you come into the board meeting, um, People understand what's going to happen and why, and and uh, um, and uh, you know, there's always going to be public disagreement. That's okay, but um, like try to minimize that and, um, and and focus on the way ahead. Thank you. I'm going to read one from Trustee McKenzie right here. Did, did he give you this? He, he provided this list yes. to me. Okay. I have the same one. I think you covered this some, but he asked, do you have specific ideas to implement at NIC regarding retention for staff and faculty? And have you implemented any of these ideas on your campuses? I think I addressed some of that. I, I, I think the, um, so my, my experience, I'll say in the Army and in higher ed, surprisingly very little difference. People stay because they like the team that they're on, and their boss hears them, supports them, and is looking out for their best interest. Um, and, and I'd say that's leadership. Um, so I, I think that retaining staff and faculty, they don't leave because of money primarily. They leave because they don't like working there anymore. And they, don't, they don't like working there anymore, not because of, you know, primarily because of the, the circumstances, the, 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 the the environment, and so we got to make sure that the staff and faculty feel supported, that they are, um, that we recognize the effort that they're putting in. We tell their story. Um, we talk, talk about their successes, and I think that goes a long way. I mean, when's the, when's the last time you saw the board talking about the successes of the faculty and staff and students at North Idaho College? Um, I'll tell you, I watched the board meeting from. June, during, it was the same day you had graduation. And the uh, whole board meeting ended. And the acting president said, wait a minute, we had graduation today. 
that to me is telling that students and faculty and staff are not first on, on the agenda. Um, to me, that should have been the opening report. Here's, here's what we did today at graduation. Telling that good story about all, you know, that there, there's, you know, 350 students graduated, something like that, in that neighborhood. 350 students, and I guarantee there were 15 stories in there that were exemplar. And you missed an opportunity to talk about those 15 students. And, and it was an afterthought that, that we mentioned that there, oh yeah, there's a graduation today. That should be first on our mind. I mean, that's the whole purpose that we're here is students graduating. And who is it that helps the students graduate? It's the faculty, staff, and administrators. So those folks should be celebrated and recognized. And where are they going? Where are those students going? Those are great stories, and we're not telling those stories. So I, that's, that's what we've, we've got to start doing, I think. Next question is mine. Okay. What is your experience with workforce training and how, what stress do you put on workforce training as part of the mission of a community college? Well, workforce training, I would say most of my workforce training, probably personal workforce training comes from my experience in the Army. All, all we do is workforce training. Um, we do it in-house for the most part, but we also do out, out uh, um, you know, you, you get sent to different colleges and universities. So I have a good bit of that. Also a lot of on the job training programs that we've developed um, and a lot of the civilian workforce programs are actually modeled off of DOD programs. So I have a lot of experience in that regard, um, but the difference is those are taxpayers paying and not students paying tuition, right? So um, so that the, I, I talked to the, we're served by two community colleges. Um, in where I'm at now, uh, Blue Ridge Community College is to our south, and um, Lord Fairfax Community College to our north, um, and and they have big programs in those areas. Um, so working with um, the community, wh where what are the um, needs of business? Um, I, I I talked to the uh, search committee about this. It's it's much easier when you have two or three major businesses in the community that are looking for career and technical education, uh, uh, career development people. Um, I, need, I need my workforce developed, here's the problem. Um, it's much more difficult. I, you know, we drove around um, town on Sunday afternoon. Everybody has a well, help wanted sign now. So what do you focus on? If you're, you know, if you're providing career and technical education to the community, it's very tough. Uh, in this market to identify and focus things that matter. I think, um, um, yeah, so uh, 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 that will change at some point, but right now um, there's, there's, a, there's a lot and I think you have to kind of generalize. So hospitality is, is obviously one, forestry is another. Um, there, there's uh, um, not a huge tech industry here, but but there are a lot of remote workers that are likely to be involved in the tech industry and just working for companies elsewhere because Coeur d'Alene is a wonderful place to live. Um, and so coming up with programs that support those needs, I think it's really, uh, we'll, we'll figure out a way to do that. Pete, you have another question? Uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, president's cabinet. What do you feel is the, the best model for the president's cabinet? Sort of the provost model or vice president model. I, I'm most familiar with the, with the provost model. Um, I think having a chief chief academic officer as, as the provost um, makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I would say I am not um, wedded to that. So if there's a, a different a different model, different reasons for changing that, I, I'm not set in my ways. But I, I'm I'm very familiar with the provost model. Um, okay, and then sort of a follow-up question to that is mentoring of those, um, you know, below on the model, so down to the provost and then down. Could you talk to us about your philosophy on, on the mentoring? Um, <laughs> one of my uh, uh, goals when I, I hire people 
is um, I, I ask people to commit to me for four years. And which doesn't sound like a long time. And usually it ends up being longer than that. Um, but I usually the first year you're learning the job. The second two years, you kind of have it figured out. And then if you if that's not your destination where you want you want to change, then that fourth year is, a, is that opportunity to kind of find things. So um, so what I do is is lay that out for the people that I hire and say, I want you to commit to me for four years. And I will, I will help you develop while you're here. I will make sure that um, when I see something that a gap in what you know or what you should know, I will find a place, we will find a place for you to go and get trained on. Um, if, if I can't personally help you, um, I will find a place for you to go to get training, to get education so that you can be developed and find success in where you're going. Um, and that fourth year, if you decide you want to leave, then I will help you find the next role. And hopefully that would be here. We'll find another role for you here. But if you're at that point where you're ready to move, um, then we will we'll, we'll make that happen. So um, in doing that, it creates an open dialogue. So people come in that fourth year, if they, if I want to try something new, um, I, I want to, I want to, whether it's on campus, off campus, or another entity, um, because we've had that honest conversation, we're, I'm able to help them and advise them on, on where to go. So again, back to communication, you've got to, got to have this open line of communication. Do, um, and if that's for professional development or for um, finding your next pathway, that's, Thank you. Yeah. John. Sir. Excuse me, we're going in order. I'm speaking for the trustee who is, you've been skipping several times now. He submitted a list of questions that you haven't addressed. People have asked multiple questions. The trustee who left abruptly left three emails from constituents. How about this, Ann Hart? What is your philosophy regarding imposing unreasonable? and privacy invading mandates upon the staff and student body of the school. It'd be that simple, Chair, if you cared about your other fellow trustees. Would you please answer that question on behalf of Trustee Bandies? I guess we'll let the um, trustee ask that question. So I, uh, I grew up in North Idaho. I was, I was not born in Idaho, I was born in Oregon, but I grew up here. Um, and one of the things that I would say is um, distinctly Idahoan is we don't like to be told what to do. Now, I also was in the army for 26 years. So sometimes there's a, a was a bit of a rub. But what I also know about folks from Idaho is that when you can, when you explain to them what, what the, the science is, what the, um, the purpose is, um, and what's going on, people tend to do the right things. So my preference always is to inform people, communicate, and give them the opportunity to do the right thing. It's John's turn for a question. My name is Chairman. Doctor, um, I wasn't able to listen to the forums today. I was traveling. So maybe you've addressed this question as Trustee Banducci suggested. Tell me your philosophy about uh, tenure. Uh, tenure. 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 Uh, I, that, was, uh, that was addressed uh, today. Um, I, I don't have an issue with tenure. Uh, um, I, it's a tenure for a four-year institution is different than a tenure for a two-year institution. Um, and we, we kind of think of tenure here at a two-year institution as more of a continuing contract, where tenure at a four-year institution is granted by the faculty. In a, um, we still have tenure review. Um, if you're not performing, if you're not, if you know, there, there are more expectations of, on a four-year faculty to do research and service. Um, than at a two year where it's mostly teaching, um, maybe teaching and service. Um, so if you're not living up to that, then tenure review is something that is alive and well on our campus. And if someone um, is not per performing well, for whatever reason, then you put them in a tenure review status. Um, you give them an opportunity to fix themselves, um, to step up their research, to step up their service, to step up their teaching performance. Um, 
and um, and if in most cases they do, but if they don't, then um, you, you know you, you can still you, you can still take appropriate actions, whatever that might be. Yeah. And Trustee McKenzie, while you were gone, I asked one of your questions. As we're asking I noticed he didn't our... start at the top. You took the softest one. During the pandemic, who made the tough decisions regarding yeah, masks, sure. forced vaccination, yes. and yes. employees? And I don't think Trustee McKenzie was recognized, and I think it was Pete's turn. He was speaking to me, and I was responding. Have you ever supported the vaccine mandates and who made the tough decisions regarding mass and forced vaccination of employees and students where you were? So the governor made the decision um, and imposed that for everyone. All state employees um, were. So uh, it was not an issue that we had to deal with. Um, and in terms of vaccine mandates, I'd say all K-12 public schools have vaccine mandates. Um, and uh, you know, Vaccine mandates have um, eradicated measles, mumps, rubella, um, you name it, every, every childhood disease from the 1950s back um, have been eliminated from, from by vaccines. I'm not, I'm not opposed to them in general, um, but um, I, under, I understand that there was a, a, some issues with um, the, the current COVID vaccine. Um, we did not have to deal with that. The governor took, took that off our plate. Thank you. Pete, it's your turn. Well, uh, I will pass it this time. And it would be your turn. Uh, would you think adding baseball and women's wrestling are good moves to boost enrollment within the next year? Do you, do you know women's wrestling is kind of a growing trend in sports? And, um, um, yeah, so, so, um, I, I can't answer that honestly. I, I think that is um, requires some more research than um, you know asking you know asking in this forum. Um, my experience is that um, athletics tends to be more for boosters than for the recruiting. Um, you know, if, if you follow football, um, JMU was ranked you know in the top five for the past few years. Um, for um, the uh, is it, um, NCS um, and um, has decided to make the jump to N, uh, the uh, F, sorry F, FBS and uh, make the jump to FBS. Uh, I don't think that makes a flip of difference in recruiting. Um, it makes more of a difference in terms of equity and inclusion and having with, having an equal number of women athletes and whatever sports that they find to be um, compelling here is more to me the question than recruiting. Are, are you you're going to see 10, 10 people, 10 more people show up here because you have women's wrestling? Maybe. Um, I, I think having a women's wrestling program is probably more um, an, an equity issue. If you have men's wrestling and you have women that want to wrestle, bring it on. Um, I would not do it as a recruiting tool. I didn't even argue to be a diversity tool too because yeah uh, that's yeah the national conferences are able to internationally recruit and yeah. ex expose the campus to a great ideas. I, I have i have no issue I, I just wouldn't do it as a recruiting thing that's all thank you john you <clears throat> dr covid has brought to us uh, uh, <clears throat> a whole bunch of online and off-campus education can you talk about your thoughts on the mix of, of uh, online versus face-to-face -face education? Um, well, I'm guessing you don't have K-12 kids. Uh, in this building? Yeah. No, no, I mean you personally, like kids in K-12. I don't. Yeah. Um, I don't have kids. I don't either. <laughs> yeah, right, that's what, that's, what, that's what I was getting at. So um, I, I think, you know, five years ago, there was a sense that online learning was the most efficient way. And if we just did online learning, everybody would be happier and we'd be so much more efficient. Ask a parent about online learning during COVID, a, a K-12 parent. Um, and, and I'm telling you, like, they were not fans. Um, and what they experienced was what, what is now conveniently termed as learning loss 
where the, they recognize that their children did not learn as much as they would have learned if they were face to face. Okay, so what does that translate to? For me, there are adults that already are mature enough to handle online learning. They can focus, they can dedicate time, they dedicate the resources necessary to do well at online learning. But there are a lot of students that haven't developed that yet. And so if, if there are other things that catch their attention and they don't have this um, responsibility to show up, be, in, be present, be in class, do their homework, and be accountable to the teacher who is there watching and, and interacting, and also to their peers, and, and hearing that live discussion of their peers, there is a whole lot of learning that takes place because of that interaction. Um, and I think that the delta between that and what we had under COVID is, is really where that gap hasn't been closed yet. And so for, you know, if, if for me personally, I'm at, the, I'm, I'm at the state in my maturity that if I wanted to learn, and I've, I've done this, I wanted to learn Python computing language. I took a class in Udacity, it was all online, great. I learned a lot. I, I'm never gonna use it again. But, but it was it was a really interesting, I, I learned a lot. Um, I don't know that every student 18 to 22 is going to do that. And so um, I, I really think that what we learned about COVID is that online learning ain't all it's cut out to be. There, it is definitely a place for some students. And I'd say even some K-12 students can do really well. It, some even do better online than they do face-to-face. -face. Um, we discovered in our school division that students with autism or somewhere on the autistic spectrum did incredibly much better online. And, be, and we thought in many cases, I, mean, I, I don't have personal contact with them, but the special ed teacher said, these, we thought these students couldn't speak. We thought they couldn't talk. That we thought they were non-audible. And when we put them online, when they're not face-to-face, -face, all of a sudden they start talking. And they, they, were, they were fully fluid. They just never uttered a word in person. So for some of those students, it, was, it, it opened doors that we didn't even know existed. Um, I think for most of our, for, for many of our other students, it was not as, um, it was not equivalent to face-to-face. -to -face. Thank you. Thank you. My turn. I think you had a chance to visit both the Parker Technical tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. Okay. Well, then my question. I, I hope you'll enjoy it. <laughs> Did you see the workforce training set? No, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll save that question. Okay. If you turn. Mr. Banducci submitted question. Uh, would you please respond individually to each of these uh, personal comments regarding these things? I didn't write this question, but it was submitted. Diversity. So just respond to the to the statement and your, your thoughts on it. So. Diversity as it's currently applied, according to this person uh, from the community, focuses on physical and cultural differences rather than differences in character, ability, ambition, and perseverance. Uh, what, what would you say to that person when you say you want diversity and they want that to just happen? What would you say to them? So one of the things that we learned um, over the years in XLab is that um, if, you have, if you have a big, ugly problem, and you assign it to an engineering class, you're going to get an engineering solution. If you assign it to a biology class, you're going to get a biology solution. If you assign it to a group of a diverse group of students from all walks of life and all disciplines, you're going to get a much more nuanced solution that might actually work. Um, and, and that's been my experience as well. Um, and so I don't, when, when people talk about diversity, I, I think just having many voices at the table is the key. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't know what the demographics here, I looked at it, it's, it, um, you know, the, it, this is not like, you know, some places in the rest of the country where you have, you know, 15% black and 10% Hispanic, um, you know, that you don't have that kind of diversity, but I think having um, diversity of thought and diversity of 
um, culture, you name it, getting all those voices together in the room gives you a more robust answer than having one voice. They're not all, like not, no one element is right. <laughs> they, all, they all bring something to the table. I didn't want to be shut off, but if you're willing to indulge me, I'd appreciate it. Uh, here's another statement uh, from the same person. The, another statement, just if you'd address it. equity, I think you've even used that word today, is an idealistic notion that promotes equal outcome rather than equal opportunity. Okay. Okay. No comment. Uh, inclusion is a way of shaming moral people to accept immoral behavior. So I submitted by Trustee Bandici. Any, any thought about, because uh, there's an effort, if you notice, each of those is diversity, equity, and con inclusion. And I, I would argue that there are benefits to diversity and equity inclusion, and a lot of people even misunderstand. And, and um, I would say, that, uh, anyway, that, that is one way. Is there any? Um, when I, so, um, I remember I, I grew up here. When I took civics class in high school, um, we did not learn about redlining. Um, we did not learn about a lot of things. I, do you know what the, um, what is it, the massive resistance? Do you know what massive resistance is? Yeah, I didn't learn about that either. Massive resistance is where um, 1947 Brown versus Board of Education, or 45, 47, 54, sorry, 54, Brown versus Board of Education. The, um, in Virginia, oh, the busing, the, uh, they, no, no, not busing. The, the, the schools in the city closed because they refused to integrate. They closed. And there was a massive movement of white people to the suburbs. And for two generations, they didn't open those schools. You ever seen, remember the Titans? That movie was 1973 when they finally reintegrated those schools in Richmond. For t almost 20 years, they did not have public schools. When they reopened, that, then that was the movie, uh, Remember the Titans. I didn't learn about that when I was in high school. You apparently didn't learn about it in high school either. Does that make you smarter? No, I don't think so. So I think not learning about those things doesn't help us. Are they divisive? Maybe. I don't feel guilty about that at all. I don't feel guilty about not knowing it. I don't feel guilty about what happened. I, I, I'm moving forward. I feel guilty about not paying attention to knowing that it happened. Right? So. So I think, I think now we have a responsibility to our students to inform them. Like I, I couldn't have looked that up when I was in high school because there was no internet. Even if there was an internet, probably wouldn't have been on it. So I don't, I don't feel guilty at all about not knowing that. It's not my fault. It's my fault moving forward. So I want to make sure that our students know the whole history. And there are some ugly things that we did as a as a, um, a white majority i don't feel like i didn't do it i don't feel guilty about it i don't want our students to feel guilty about it but i do want them to know about it thank you am i allowed to ask a question on my side uh, I think my sheet? wait no that was that was a banducci question oh, let's excuse me. Go ahead. <laughs> please you guys have tried to stifle their questions this whole time so let's see uh Some of you kind of already answered, so I'll... Uh... All right, this college has major cultural improvements needed. And if you don't give the influential bodies what they want, then you will be in their target areas. That's been proven. So how will you go about leveraging people when you... So talking to your leadership style, question number one. When they're trying to destroy you as a president because you do not do their bidding. Like, for example, you don't get placed on our board agenda or a raise or you represent, like, an opposing political party that they're red versus blue or whatever. Um, how are you going to deal with that scenario that you're coming into? So um, I'm going to stay focused on the mission of the college. I miss, the mission of the college is to take care of the students, take care of the faculty, take care of the staff, and take care of the institution. I'm going to be laser focused on those four things. 
And as a board, I expect you to support me in that area. And I am not going to play politics. I'm going to support students, faculty, staff, and the college. And your role is to support me as the president. John, do you have a question? Or do you... I will pass. I'm, okay. I'm enjoying this. Okay. Great. Does that mean I'm the only one left with questions? No, I had questions, but go ahead. I'll let you go next. Okay. How will you go about repairing the public image, as you referenced uh, from the students, that the high school counselors uh, were not interested in sending kids here? Um, and knowing that the public also knows that our constituent group leaders have introduced a political agenda instead of being focused on the mission. So you said you'll be focused on how, how will you steer others? I think I already, I think that's pretty much my answer to the last one. I'm going to be laser focused on those four, the, the things that matter. And um, I think that, that the other thing is I, I need the board to be focused on those things that matter. And, and the things that matter are students, faculty, staff, and the college, and how we integrate in the community. And, um, and I think that's, that's critical. How would you engage with those individuals uh, who want to keep, and I see, wait a minute. There are some in this uh, community that want to keep NIC's community college focused on the community. And then there's others, so-called elites, who want NIC to become a four-year university. What's your vision of NIC? I, you know, the, my vision of NIC is a community college. Um, if, if the community decides that it, it wants NIC to be a four-year, um, you know, it's going to it's, it's not a couple of people that are going to decide that. It's, you know, the state's going to have to weigh in. There's going to have to be plenty of, of local support to make that happen. It, it's not a few people that are going to make that decision. So I, I, I don't know that that's necessarily a super well-informed question because it, it's, it's not that simple. If, if I came in as the president and said, we're going to be a four-year, the state would probably laugh at us. Um, I don't like to be laughed at. Mr. Chairman, I do have a question. Yes, John. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Doctor, um, I, I think you're aware that we are in trouble as far as accreditation goes. Can you tell us um, how you've dealt with such issues in the past? So I had a very frank conversation today with the President's Council. Um, um, and, and one of the things, I, I've been on several, through several SACS reviews and uh, NK reviews. So I'm very familiar with the accreditation process. Um, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the accreditation issues before us today are a result of board actions. Um, some of them were kind of silly, and that is we're required to have five member board. And so the first one was you had four because of a resignation and you couldn't appoint another one. And so that was one of the points. Okay, great. Um, but but, and I understand the, the hassle. I, I, there was a lot of stuff going on there, but, um, but that was number one. And the rest of it is, has all been related to board action. So we, you know, we got to get the board um, up to speed on, on their role. And um, it, accreditation is incredibly important. Um, and so making sure that the board understands how their actions relate to um, accreditation and how accreditation relates to everything that happens on the college is, is incredibly important. If you lose accreditation, you lose financial aid opportunities. Um, you, I mean, it just, it, 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 it becomes a house of cards, everything kind of collapses. And so maintaining your accreditation is incredibly important. Um, and I think we just, we just really need to reflect on that as a uh, board. So just in context, the interim president um, is, has been successfully uh, trimming administrative blow, and, and this year they've given more than $250,000 in bonuses to existing staff and faculty through sal salary salvage. So you mentioned the provost model. In my mind, it's saving a ton of money. Um, the prior uh, presidents before him has, have failed to do that, to be honest. 
Uh, would you be willing to continue this trend and honestly make the tough choices and trim the administration below like the college? It's kind of a. Uh, so making tough choices, I, I, I've done that. Um, I, to, to answer that question, though, implies that I would agree with their, that there's an administrative bloat, and I don't know that to be the case. So I don't want to I don't want to answer that question directly and 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 admit to administrative bloat that may or may not exist. I don't I don't know. Yes, Making tough questions um, about the administration, the structure of the college, I would take um, and I would also say it needs to come. You know, some of those decisions, I would say, come back to the board. If we're going to make major major organizational changes at the senior leadership level, I, I would I would come back and bring that back to the board for consultation. And then also, what we're going to do with the if if there is any money saved along the way, um, those decisions about uh, money saving, what to do with them, whether it's to provide bonuses or um, other sort of compensation packages to the faculty um, and staff. And I, again, I would bring that back to the board for for the consultation. So have you personally brought, so it seems, I'm sensing a lot of DOD experience, uh, have you personally brought industry into your region non-DOD and supported programs on your campus? Absolutely. Um, so uh, right now there's a move for um, my institution to jump to Northern Virginia. Um, and uh, there's a, an alumni group that's very powerful. Um, they're not DOD. They're very powerful, and they've asked me to um, take on the role of creating a new campus in Northern Virginia. Um, you all probably don't follow it, but um, Amazon Headquarters 2 just moved to Arlington, just set up shop in Arlington. Um, as a result of that, Virginia Tech is building a $2 billion campus uh, in, next door to Amazon's headquarters. Um, University of Virginia is setting up a $1.5 billion campus a couple blocks down the road. Um, and, and so what they're asking me to do is set up a campus um, to, to attract business um, back to JMU um, out of Northern Virginia. So um, why did they reach out to me? Because I have a proven track record of adding value, bringing, um, bringing value back to the institution. So I, to, to say we brought industry into the community, I, I'd say um, the economic development folks, whenever there's a, a business that wants to relocate, the city's economic development um, people invite me down to talk to them because we have uh, this reputation of being the applied arm of a four-year institution. And so having workforce development, they, they'll, they'll invite the, the community colleges and they'll invite me because we have the ability to bridge those two. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, that we're pretty well known. There's there are a couple of organizations that are all related to economic development and, and we get, you know, Nick, can you come down and, and, uh, and talk to these folks that are busy. I'm gonna read an email that uh, Trustee Van Dushi left here, and the email asked a number of questions, and some of them are just yes or no answers, I think. So feel free if you think they're a yes or no answer to just answer them briefly. Should people on campus be allowed to choose their bathroom as in male and female rooms? Number two, should biological men be allowed to play on women's sports teams? Three, should any Antifa events be allowed on campus or supported in the community? Do you think CRG should be taught on campus? Yes, no, no, yes. Yes. No, I, I, um, I, I, um, I, so I, I think um, folks our age get way more tuned up about issues of gender identity than the students do. Um, and, and so I, I don't make a big deal about that and folks will figure it out. I don't support or, or I'm, I'm not opposed or in favor of issues of gender identity. Um, and um, so, so yeah, um, Antifa, I would prefer nobody protests on campus um, because typically protesting on campus 
especially groups like Antifa and and other more, I'll say, militant kind of groups, um, they don't leave the place in good shape. And, and, and so when they come in and protest, regardless of who they are, um, I, you know, uh, I, I just would prefer they not um, find someplace else to protest. Uh, I, I, I support and defend your right to protest. Just do it somewhere else. Go to go to University of Iowa. <laughs> In closing, do you think this uh, number four of what you just said? Do you think? CRT should be taught and I'll say infused into courses on campus. Course, yeah. CRT, do you think CRT should be taught or infused into course material on campus? Okay. Uh, so CRT is a very um, nuanced uh, theory that I doubt that anybody complaining about it can actually identify what it is. Um, and as I've said earlier um, about the, you know, did you, you know, did you know about the redlining and um, the, the massive resistance? Is that critical race theory? If I, if I said, I want you to learn about that, is that critical race theory? No, I'd say more CRT is viewing everything in the view of uh, race and how it's factored in. Right, so the, so the challenge is some people would view teaching the rest of history as CRT. So CRT is really loosely defined. It was actually a legal argument that was made as a way of doing statistical analysis of, to try to define if, if there was systemic racism or not. So it's not really something you teach. It's a tool used by lawyers to sue you if, you're, um, if the numbers don't match. So I, I don't know that anybody really is teaching CRT, as I understand it, um, and for North Idaho College, which really teaches intro level courses, 100 and 200 level courses, I don't think that it is something that would even come up. I, I can't see an appropriate position for it to come up. Teaching history of race, absolutely. Teaching critical race theory, I, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know what. Um, I, I don't know what your definition of critical race theory is. Um, and then, if I may, it would, it would be one of many theories presented. I would imagine. Yeah, right. I mean, it, it, like I, I think people do better knowing more, right? So if I teach you, here's a theory that some people believe, and here's a theory that some people believe, and here's another theory that some people believe, and I'm not, pro, you know, I'm not proselytizing any of them. I'm telling you that these are theories that are out there that you will experience in your life. I think students walk away from that understanding what they're going to be faced with in the future and better able to deal with that. And I think that's okay. But proselytizing any one of those theories, particularly for gen ed, like the 100 and 200 level courses, probably not appropriate. That's all. Okay. And these questions that are all uncovered, so. I would say that I would agree. So you have another one? I do. Uh, well, I mean, I think, actually, I heard earlier that you didn't have much, the foundation more engaged with you. You didn't necessarily deal much with the endowment, so I'm going to skip that question. Um, no, I, I do have a couple, like I said, uh, a couple of well, major question. foundations that, that may or may not follow me out here um, if I come. Um, and I, I, you know, I, my question was, have you ever fundraised for endowments or just, just fundraising and more? Yeah, it, it's, 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 not, it's not something I've been allowed to do. Now, I, I bring in about probably just my, in, in my area of influence, I probably bring in three quarters of a million a year. Um, through all the programs that I produce, just in my area. Um, I'm probably in the top 10 of external funding through grants and foundations. Um, but but I, don't, I don't fundraise, I do cool things and people give me money. 
I can take that one step further. Here we have a great fundraising department, but the president can be a, a strong advocate to go along with anybody that's trying to raise money. So hopefully, would that be your role? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, again, being present, observing, participating, um, I, I make connections um, with with people um, pretty easily. And so I, I would like, I, I would be happy. I would, I would be upset if somebody was out fundraising and I didn't know about it. I would like to participate. Um, I, I think I'm pretty good about selling the college. I, I think that's a wonderful resource for Northern Idaho. And, um, and, and so I, I should be telling that story um, along with all of you, right? I mean, you all should be telling that story as well. Um, yeah. Thank you. Have another question? Just, there is, so just context, these three are going to come up for election in November too. Um, and it's basically the board coming in November and every president faces, I believe you're on an elected trustee board, um, is there's a good possibility that the, the a large change in November um, could happen. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Or, um, well, I, I, I think that the, Philosophically, the same thing applies, is that the board is a governance and, and really has a role in communicating resource requirements, communicating good stories, and then helping me manage the, the institution. Um, and so what do we focus on? Again, those four things, students, faculty, staff, and the institution. And so, um, we're going to stay focused on those things. Um, and the, the more we can stay focused on those four things, um, the better everyone is going to be. There, I, I think the, the faculty and staff here are phenomenal. Um, you know, of course, you have some that are, you know, probably ready to retire and some that are just getting started and need, you know, need some professional development. But by and large, and this is the story I got from both of my friends who are community college presidents back in Virginia, is that, you know, community college staff and faculty are really passionate about helping those students move to the next level. And so we need to make sure that they feel respected and rewarded and appreciated. And, and I think we should do that. That's, that's our responsibility. As the senior leadership of the college, it's our responsibility to make sure that those folks feel respected and recognized. I want to thank all the trustees for being here tonight and doing a really good job of working together to try to get these questions through and help you explain to us what you can do for NIC. Uh, I have one question left. We're about ready to finish. And before I ask that question, do you have one little burning question you'd like to get uh, it's what I try to get allow you to use all your questions, and I've tried to do all of Trustee Van Dusky's questions, so I don't want you feeling like you were left out. Well, I just don't want any of the candidates uh, to get favorable questions and unfavorable questions. So I'll ask one that I asked um, from Thursday and was protected from asking on Friday because these guys shielded and changed the process midway in this interview process. Um, it's been communicated to me that uh, this board intends to tie future board's hands by providing whoever they hire a golden parachute. Um, what, will you, what, what are your thoughts on accepting a golden parachute if you were to be chosen? I, I don't know. I, I think um, you're asking me to give up a, a program that I have now that I've built to national prominence and come out here and take over a college where the last president was fired without cause. I don't know how much of a parachute I need to make that happen, but but there's there's got to be some sort of a like you know I, I I quit all that, move out here, and and you guys decide to fire me without cause. That ain't fair either. So. I don't, I don't know what the right answer is to that, um, uh, you know, but, but I, 
you have established a sense of trust issue, right? So we, as a as an incoming president, I gotta trust you, and part of that trust is gonna be a contract, kind of like a prenup, right? So I want, to, you know, we're, we're gonna be in this together, and and if and if you're, you shouldn't be worried about a golden parachute. You shouldn't, it shouldn't be no concern, right? If, if you put a golden parachute in my contract and don't ever do anything to cause that to be activated, you got nothing to worry about. So if, if, there, if your intentions are to hire me to come out here and then fire me at the first opportunity, and by God, I'm going to have a golden parachute. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's just, that's, that's a circumstance. I understand the circumstances that I'm coming into. And so um, if I want to come out here and work with you and build back the trust and respect of the college. And it's going to take, um, to change culture, to change attitudes, to change beliefs, to change trust, it takes three or four years. So I'm, I'm willing to make that commitment, but, but with some security. Thank you for that very open and honest answer to that question. The only last question I had is, do you have any questions that we could answer for you? Well, I think that um, I, I would say uh, the Poly Group folks have, um, have done a great job setting us up. Um, I'm, I'm told that a decision, at least a preliminary decision, might be made as early as the 22nd of June. Um, so I, if, you know, I, I just kind of want to know the timeline. I, I've, I've done my research. I've done, I'm, I'm pretty well informed about what's going on. I'm, I'm not, I'm walking in with my eyes wide open. So if, if you could just explain the, the kind of your timeline, how you see it and how you see the, the next steps transpiring, I, I would appreciate that. You're right on with that date. Hopefully that's the date that will make a decision. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for answering questions, difficult questions at times, in an honest and open way. We appreciate that very, very much. We hope you'll have a great tour of the campus tomorrow and a safe trip back to Virginia. If, we, uh, if, if, if you hire me, we'll continue to have those open conversations. Though. That sounds wonderful. <clears throat> On that note, meeting is adjourned. Thank you. 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 Thank you.